It has occurred to me that my last few presentations have been a bit bleak. Murders, shipwrecks and witch trials, just to name a few. So today, I thought I'd bring you a tale that, despite its twists and turns, does have a happy ending. A tale of a young man and a young woman, one from Norfolk, one from Suffolk, who, after falling afoul of the law, would find each other in the squalid conditions of a prison, before going to start their new life on the other side of the world. Our story begins in 1762, when the first of our couple, Susanna Holmes, is born to Josiah and Eunice Holmes. Little is known about her early life, including the exact date of her birth, but it is known through parish records that she was baptised on the 6th of March, 1764, in St Mary's Church in the village of Serlingham, a few miles from Norwich, and she had a brother and sister. Like many of her time, her family were poor, but tried to make the best of things as Susanna grew up. The year after her birth, 33 miles to the south, across the county border in Suffolk, in the village of Laxfield, Henry Cable was born. Like Susanna, the exact date of his birth has long since been lost to history. But again, like Susanna, he was baptised, this time, in All Saints Church in Laxfield, on the 26th of August, 1764. He would go on to be the eldest of nine children. In line with their births, very little is known about their early lives, although Henry was recorded as being a labourer at the time of his arrest. They most likely grew up in their respected areas, helping their parents with various jobs. It is also unclear if either of them had any run-ins with the law before the events that would bring them together. By the time of her crime, Susanna was now working as a maid to a woman called Jabez Taylor in Thirlton. In November of 1783, she was taken into custody and held in Norwich Castle Goal for allegedly stealing from said employer clothing, linen and silver spoons, adding up to a value of 53 shillings. She would remain in prison until her trial on the 19th of March, 1784, in the town of Thetford. Today, these kind of charges might not sound too bad, but in 1784, they fell fully under what was known as the Bloody Code, a list of over 150 crimes that, if the judge saw fit, carried the death penalty. So, when Justice Nares donned his traditional black cap and sentenced Susanna to be hanged for her crimes, it seemed that her race was well and truly run. Exactly why Susanna escaped her appointment with the gallows is not exactly known, possibly due to her young age, or that hanging women was generally looked down upon and saved only for those who had committed truly horrendous crimes. Her death sentence was commuted to 14 years transportation. She was taken back to Norwich Gal to await her punishment. It was here, in the dark of the Castle Gal, that she first met a young man, Henry Cable, himself imprisoned for burglary. Henry's fall from grace had come in the form of a much more violent robbery than the sneaking away with some of your employer's belongings. He, along with his father, who was also called Henry, his uncle, or possibly just a friend of his father, Abraham Carman, and another man, Abraham Jacobs, broke into a house belonging to a Mrs. Abigail Hamley in the village of Alborough on the Norfolk Suffolk border. A local newspaper of the time describes the scene. Last week, some villains broke into the house of Mrs. Hamley at Alborough near Halston in this county, and during the absence of the family who were in this city, stripping it of everything movable, taking the hangings from the bedsteads, and even the meat out of the pickle casks. It is supposed they also regaled themselves with wine, having left several empty bottles behind them, and the marks of the feet of their horses being seen in the orchard by a neighbour was what first led to the discovery of the burglary. The four would escape the scene of their crime and went into hiding until the heat died down, but their freedom was not to last long. Local constable Mr Tiggs and his men were on the case and looking for these villains. The group were soon tracked down to Abraham Carman's house near the coastal town of Southwold in Suffolk. A few days after the burglary, Tiggs and three assistants arrived at the house with a warrant to search the property. Finding the doors locked and seeing people inside in the middle of burning as much evidence as they could, they began to break the door down. Finally gaining entrance to the building, they were attacked by the Cables, Carmen and Jacobs, who is said to have been a member of the East Suffolk Militia. In the fight, Constable Tiggs was badly cut across the head. The three lawmen looked like they were about to be overwhelmed by these four desperate individuals, and had not passing locals come to their aid, they very well might have been. As the police gained the upper hand again, Henry and Abraham Jacobs fled, but Carmen and Henry Sr. were shortly arrested. During the search of the house, sacks full of belongings of Mrs. Hamblings were found, and a few days later, both Henry and Jacobs caught and arrested themselves. There was no way of denying what they'd done, and all four confessed to their crimes. Standing trial, and as with Susanna, their crimes being listed among the bloody code, they were promptly sentenced to death. But unlike his future wife, we do know how Henry escaped his fate. Judge Baron I wrote a fairly standard letter of the time, asking for the king's mercy for the younger men who had been condemned to death. He was pardoned by the Home Secretary, Lord North, and his sentence was commuted to transportation. Possibly, along with Abraham Jacobs, 
who disappears from the story after this point. His father and uncle were not so lucky, though. Dying on the scaffold on the 5th of April, 1783, the fate was described rather frankly in the local paper, the Norfolk Chronicle. On Saturday last, Carmen and Cable were executed on Norwich Castle Hill in punishment for their crimes. Another bit of good fortune that had come the way of Henry and Susanna, and the reason they were able to get to know each other, was that the punishment of transportation had been halted. At this time, transportation was to the West Indies and North America. But things had changed in 1776. With the American Revolution gaining pace, these transportations had been put on hold until the Crown could bring the 13 colonies back under its control, a task that we now know it failed to do. And after eight years of war, British forces surrendered at Yorktown, and America now stood an independent nation, ending all transportation to their shores. The loss of America had also made the British government wary about transporting criminals anywhere near this newly founded republic. Fears of an American invasion of Canada or even the Caribbean were high, and the idea of filling these areas with thousands of criminals who would have much more of an incentive to fight for an invading American army than for the government who had imprisoned them was not a task any of them were willing to take. Somewhere new must be found. With this in mind, the eyes of the officials looked elsewhere, mostly to the vast, unexplored continent that had only had its coastline charted and a certain areas reported as favourable for the establishment of a colony by James Cook back in 1770. But while this was arranged, all those awaiting their new lives could do was wait. And wait, Henry and Susanna did, for three years, in some of the worst conditions imaginable. The cells of Norwich Gal were in the Norman-built castle from 1075, with rudimentary shelters built inside the castle keep and down in the old dungeons. And for those in those cells, they might as well have been in a medieval dungeon. It was crowded, unsanitary, blistering hot in the height of summer, and freezing the depths of winter. The lower cells often flooded, food was minimal and far from appetising. Most prisoners relied on food, brought in by friends and families, and even locals who took pity on these poor wretches in the middle of their city. The gal system as a whole was very corrupt. Bribes were the prime way that guards, or the turnkeys as they were known, made their money, as they received no salary for their jobs, with some even having to pay every year to maintain these jobs. Despite all this, the couple still had each other, and, thankfully, the prison's chief warder, George Glean, was somewhat of a humane man for his time and his chosen profession. Inmates were not shackled constantly, and, unlike in many gals, he allowed the prisoners to mix and socialise. And there was certainly some mixing done between Susanna and Henry as she fell pregnant and gave birth in the spring of 1786 to his child in the prison, a son who they would name Henry, in honour of his hanged father. Shortly after Henry Jr.'s birth, the couple even asked permission to marry, but were refused, as due to felons, they had been stripped of all their civil rights under the law. 1786 might have brought the joy of a baby to the couple, but it would also bring some dreadful news that would tear the family apart. People across the country who lived with gals near their cities were rapidly becoming concerned with the growing numbers of prisoners being held in their towns while waiting for transportation. Norwich was no exception. And soon, the government had received a petition to do something about this growing problem. Soon, word came that transportation were to begin again, to a far more distant shore than they were before. When the news reached Norwich in November, so did a list of who was to travel to Plymouth. One of them was Susanna. Bidding a tearful farewell to Henry, she and her baby son were escorted to Plymouth by one of the prison's turnkeys, named John Simpson. Arriving in Plymouth on the 5th of November, 1786, she was taken to the prison ship Dunkirk where the terrible split of her family was about to get far worse. The governor of the Dunkirk, Henry Bradley, clearly a stickler for rules, checking through the paperwork given to him by Simpson, pointed out that his orders were to hold Susanna and two other women that had been brought with her, nothing about her five-month-old child. With the aid of sailors, she and her child were separated. Susanna was dragged below decks and the child was handed to John Simpson, who was about to do something extraordinary. Rather than doing the expected, and making the long journey back to Norwich and turning the baby over to the care of his father, he made the journey to London. If the prison hulk's governor was going to be such a strickler for orders, Turnkey Simpson would go straight to a man who most certainly outranked him, Thomas Townsend, Lord Sidney, the Home Secretary. Now today, someone approaching someone in a high level in government to air their grievances is not something completely unexpected, and it does happen, although it often won't get you very far. But in Georgian Britain, time governed by class, rules and decorum 
The very idea of a man like John Simpson even talking to someone of such importance, let alone making demands of him, was unthinkable. Undeterred by any of this, John Simpson made the journey to London with the baby in tow. Arriving in the capital on the first coach he could, he left the baby in the care of a careful woman, as a newspaper described her, and went straight to Lord Sydney's offices, where he was finalising the plans for this fleet of ships to sail. He was stopped at the front door and refused entry. But he'd come too far to turn back now. Making entry through a side door, he now made his way to where he believed the offices must be. Sadly, it wasn't long until he was stopped again and told he could arrange a meeting with Lord Sydney, but it would require several days at least to sort this out. He suddenly saw the very man he'd come to see. Lord Sydney was descending the staircase straight towards him. Pushing his way past the footman, he ran towards the Home Secretary, who was a more than a little shocked by this turn of events. But before he could command his footman to remove Simpson, the terrible tale was being told to him. The family split up, the cruel governor separating mother and child, and soon Lord Sidney not only began to listen, but empathise. Possibly due to some strange form of kinship, as Lord Sidney himself was from Norfolk. Whatever his reasoning, he soon agreed that something must be done. He wrote orders that John Simpson was to collect Henry from his prison cell and reunite mother, father and baby who were all to sail together. John Simpson once again returned to Norwich to fetch a delighted Henry and bring him to join his wife and child in transportation. Arriving back in Plymouth on the 15th of November, his job now done, John Simpson made a final journey back to Norwich. His little adventure behind him, he had covered close to 700 miles all around. He had become a countrywide talking point for a while. He was even gifted six guineas by Lady Cardigan, a British noblewoman, for showing such humanity to a female convict. He would be widely hailed as a hero and become known as the Humane Turnkey. But after this, nothing is known about his life. After some waiting and a move to Portsmouth, the 11 ships made sail for this strange faraway land of Australia on the 13th of May, 1787. What would come to be known as the First Fleet was made six convict ships, three supply ships, and escorted by two Royal Navy vessels. 800 convicts were sailing for their new lives. Henry, Susanna, and Henry Jr. among them aboard the Friendship. But unlike their unfortunate shipmates, they were not sailing empty-handed. Their story had been taken to the hearts of many in the public, and money had been raised by a Mrs. Jackson of Portsmouth Square, London, to buy them clothes and possessions for their new life. The 13,000-mile journey from Portsmouth to the shores of Australia took 252 days, with a stop in Cape Town, South Africa, where Susanna was temporarily separated from her family when her and some other female convicts were taken off the friendship and placed on the Charlotte to make room for some sheep. During the long journey, Henry soon became a trusted convict, something that would serve him well when they reached their destination, and was given much more freedom aboard the ship than others. Amazingly, despite how treacherous this around-the-world journey was, not a single ship was lost to storms or the icebergs of the Southern Ocean. But not all on board would be so lucky. 43 would die en route, and even 22 babies were born to female prisoners and the wives of marines and sailors that were accompanying them. They sailed into Botany Bay on the 18th of January, 1788, but found the area unsuitable to land and sailed to what was Port Jackson about a week later. They would soon rename the area Sydney Cove after Lord Sydney. Upon their arrival on the 26th of January, Captain Arthur Phillip, one of the Royal Navy officers sent with orders from Lord Sydney to establish a penal colony, wanted to go ashore and find a suitable location. What happened next is slightly debated. There is no written evidence of it happening, but it has entered Australian legend, not wishing to get wet crossing from the ship's jolly boat to the beach. Captain Phillip asked for a volunteer from the convicts to carry him ashore. Henry Cable stepped forward, saying he would do it. And with Henry being described as a fine, healthy young fellow, Philip agreed. Being taken with the captain and a few others, he stepped into the surf as they reached the shallows, and Captain Philip climbed upon his back and was carried to the shore, making Henry Cable the first convict and the first permanent Western settler to set foot on Australian soil. The women remained on board the ships until the 6th of February, and Susanna finally joined Henry ashore. And four days later, they, along with four other couples, were married by the fleet's chaplain making them the first Western marriages in the country. A few months later, on the 1st of July, they issued a writ saying that their clothes that were being brought aboard another ship hadn't been given to them, and even after multiple requests, they still heard nothing about them. This would be the first civil case tried by English law held in Australia, and the cables were awarded £15. So, as you can see, in the time, the cables had set more than a fair few of firsts. 
but there was more to come in future. And as in terms of intake into Australia, they were going to be far from the last. At least 80,000 more convicts would follow them on their journey in the following years. The first few years of their new life was tough, to say the least. They lived in primitive housing. Food was very scarce. Famine and disease often swept through the settlement, leaving many wishing they had gone to the gallows. But as time went on, the cables didn't just survive, they flourished. Henry started out as a night watchman, looking after Captain Phillips, now Governor Phillips, vegetable garden, before being promoted to the overseer of a convict work gang, and then made constable, and eventually even promoted to being the first chief constable of New South Wales. Their family grew too. Susanna would give birth to ten more children, but sadly one would not survive. When not working in his new life in law enforcement, Henry ran a public house called the Ramping Horse, possibly named after Rampant Horse Street in Norwich, that could be found just a short distance from the castle where Henry had been imprisoned. And, on the topic of prisons, in possibly the strangest turn of Henry's life, one of his jobs as the chief constable placed him in charge of a gaol himself. Henry had not fully cleaned up his act, though, and was dismissed from these positions in 1802 for illegally buying pigs from a ship that was visiting the local port. What might already sound like two very full lives were not over yet. Neither was the Cable's lists of firsts. As the colony grew, so did the need for trade across the Pacific, and a fleet of ships was commissioned to be built. The first of these was named Diana, after the Cable's eldest daughter. This same Diana Cable would go on to marry a civil servant in what was Australia's first society wedding. After Henry and Susanna had fulfilled their sentences, they grew richer still. They went from being poor country folk forced to turn to crime to survive, to the owners of several estates, trading partnerships, they were ship owners, land owners, farmers, shop and brewery owners, and even ran Australia's first stagecoach company. Although, of course, their businesses had its fair share of ups and downs along the way. Susanna died in 1825, aged 61. Henry would live on for another 21 years, before passing on the 18th of March, 1846, aged 84. They are buried together in the family vault and St Matthew's Churchyard, Windsor, County of Cumberland, New South Wales. Sadly, despite everything they did and their truly remarkable lives, we have no idea what either of them actually looked like. No paintings, if they ever existed, have survived, although it is believed that Henry had red hair. Although little known in their home counties, or even their country of birth, the Cables are names well noted among the first fleeters, or accidental pioneers, as they are sometimes known. With Susanna, being voted one of Australia's most important female historical figures. The descendants of the Cable family are still around today, and they have family reunions in a Sydney restaurant appropriately named Cables. Together, they have marked several important dates of their ancestors, such as the 250th anniversary of Susanna's birth and the 230th of the wedding. Some have even made the journey to Norfolk and Suffolk to see where Henry and Susanna grew up and were imprisoned. The story of the Cables was told in the album The Transports by Norfolk-raised folk singer and person I hope to cover in a future presentation, Peter Bellamy, in 1977. A link to the album can be found in the description for those interested. There has also been several plays made based around this incredible story, but, rather shockingly, the lives of Henry and Susanna have never been portrayed in television or film. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. All of the information and pictures used can be found in the description below. Feel free to like and subscribe if you wish. I have a Twitter and Instagram if you want to follow me there as well. This was Henry Cable and Susanna Holmes, from English rogues to Australian heroes. And this was A Little Bit of History.